they have a really neat website for Charlie's Church, First Southern, ba First Southern Baptist Church of Magnet Cove. And uh, it doesn't have a, the title to the sermon, but it has the date, which I believe it was the 16th. And uh, it has a morning service and then an evening service. And mine is the evening service on John chapter 10. Paul here in Philippians chapter 3 is going to begin to teach us how to break from super grace status into ultra super grace. And we're going to follow him along the way. I want to review what we looked at last week. Verse 1, finally, this word was used to break into a new sentence, a new paragraph. Finally, my brethren, born again believers, rejoice in the Lord. That's where we draw our happiness, our relationship with Jesus Christ. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Paul says, for me to use repetition is not tedious for me. In matter of fact, it is great advantage for you to hear it over and over and over again. It's a safeguard. Beware of dogs. We looked at the doctrine of dogs. He's going to give three descriptions of the super apostles who were the uh, religious Jews that came in behind him. The first is he called them dogs. We looked at the doctrine of dogs last week. These were the uh, religious legalists. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. And you know, evil is the policy of Satan. And so when you see evil workers, it's not necessarily that they're going out and doing really bad things. This can be human good. And an evil worker can be someone who does genuinely good things. But they're not used, they're not led of the spirit. And they're obviously functioning out of the source of their sin nature. And isn't it amazing that one of Satan's policies that he uses against mankind is if he can't kill you, just get you busy doing all the good that you can do independently of God. All the good you can do independently of God. And so we see here, evil workers, beware of the mutilation. And this point to the fact that these uh, religious legalists were preaching the fact that if you wanted to be right with God, if you wanted to be uh, go to heaven, you had to be circumcised. And Paul teaches that's foolishness. Verse 3 is our new verse for the week. For we are the circumcision. And if you just stop right there, you would say, wow, you know, we are the Jews here. He's talking about the circumcision. But he's not talking about the Jews. He's talking about born-again believers of the church age. We're going to see he's talking about even further along than that. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So let's look at these three ideas that he put forth here. Who worship God in the spirit. Remember John, where John says, uh, it says in the Gospel of John, for those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And Jesus was talking about, he was prophesying about the church age where in the past in Judaism, the worship was rit ritual, wasn't it, at the temple. And now we're going to come into a new dispensation where worship is no longer ritual sacrifice, but now worship is going to be in the sphere of the spirit, the spiritual life, and in doctrine. And so you look at the idea, there's all kinds of ways to worship God. If we had a worship service and uh, we wanted it to be successful, we'd say, well, we need people. We need believers. And so what is a worship service? It's where believers are coming together. So first of all, you're going to have fellowship in a worship service, right? And then if you wanted to have a worship service, you could say, well, we need giving. And giving is a legitimate extension of worship. 
so we could have fellowship, we'd have a group of believers, we'd have fellowship, we'd have giving. Well, also, the Bible says that singing is a part of worship and that um, we sing and spirit in uh, song and we worship God. And so singing is a part of worship. And so obviously we put together a worship service, but what's the most important aspect of worship? What's the most important aspect of worship? And that is thinking truth, thinking truth. And if you can't think of truth, guess what? You might as well get rid of the rest of it. Because you can come together and have fellowship and sing and give and leave in just as bad a shape as you came in, in, right? No answers for life. So the idea here is in John chapter 4 that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And everything else falls into a close second. So Paul is pointing to the fact here that spiritual men and women worship in the spirit. Secondly, rejoice in Christ Jesus. We glory in him. We point to Christ. Not glory in man. Not glory in religion. Not glory in uh, man-made things. But we glory in Christ. Then have no confidence in the flesh. And here the flesh is... You know, when you see the word flesh in the Bible, it can point to the sin nature. It can point to, uh, most of the time, it's pointing to the sin nature. Here it's pointing to human superiority. In other words, manward, not Godward, but human superiority. And so we're going. he's going to continue the idea of confidence in the flesh in verse 4. I want to... We're going to look at the seven superiorities that Paul had in the flesh. Because if Paul, if, if anybody could boast about the flesh, it would be Paul. Verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh... If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. In other words, if you want to start comparing human superiority, I want to get first in line, buddy. You can put the blue ribbon on me, and I'm going to show you how. He's going to compare himself to the super apostles, and he's going to blast them out of the water in the flesh. And he's going to show seven different ways that he is superior in the flesh. The first way was ritual superiority. He says, circumcised on the eighth day. We know that every true blue Jewish boy, if his parents observed the law, and the Mosaic law said, on the eighth day, have the male circumcised. And so Paul was uh, raised in a Jewish household where they observed the law, and they took young Saul of Tarsus, and he was circumcised on the eighth day. And so he had ritual superiority. Other These other Jewish apostles, uh, see, this was only a conservative Jewish family would actually follow the law to the letter. And many of these others uh, were circumcised somewhere along the way, but not necessarily by their own family or on the eighth day. The second way is his DNA. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. And that means that Paul had the DNA of Abraham. And it's my conclusion that both his mother and his father were Jewish. Nowadays, if you live in Israel, 
they believe you're Jewish if your mother was a Jew and your father doesn't it could be a Gentile. But it's my my opinion that he knew the line of his mother and his father and that they uh were both Jewish and so he had the DNA of Abraham. The third superiority of his flesh is that his tribe, he it was the tribe of Benjamin. This, we would say, family. We have some of the Rogers in our church. They're a tribe. You got that? <laughs> There's enough for them to make war you now. <laughs> they can form a battalion. So here's what's interesting. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin was known for fierce fighters, warriors. And it's amazing because the northern tribes went down on the fifth cycle of discipline, but two of the southern tribes were able to hold out Judah and Benjamin. And they held out for another 150 years after the Assyria took out the northern tribes. And so uh, Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, was famous for sticking in there and fighting it out and uh, uh, being a true uh, stickler uh, for their uh, obedience to God. And so the tribe of Benjamin... He was from one of the superior tribes. Uh, Hebrew of Hebrews. And this points to the fact that he was a conservative patriot. The Bible promotes the idea that we ought to be patriotic to our nation. And I still have contempt for the idea that the church needs to embrace internationalism. That is, go out and scoop up every illegal that you can and bring them into your church. And I have a close friend that is doing that very thing in Arkansas. Now, I'm not going to say that I don't want to evangelize them. You got that? I don't want to see them born again. But friend, go back to your country and make it good there with your spiritual growth. And that's how it's going to happen. Don't come drag my country down. God demands patriotism towards your own flag, your own nation. You say, well, how can I make my, my country better? My government officials are all corrupt. Become a government official. My police are all corrupt. Become a policeman and take your integrity with you and straighten some things out. And so until we grasp a hold of the idea that we ought to be conservative patriots in our own nation, we're going to have trouble. And uh, the mission field might as well be canceled. We'll just bring everybody over here. You don't have to go out there and start any churches. Just drag them here. And so Paul says, I was a conservative patriot, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew how to fly the Jewish flag, in other words. It's funny because in his era, there were conservatives and there were liberals. We have them now. The conservatives stuck with the Torah. They stuck with the first five books of the Bible. And they followed it. The liberals followed Alexander's idea. See, Alexander the Great came into Judea about 300 B.C. And he spread the Greek culture. The Greek culture was, it, was, it went against the Hebrew culture. We're talking about fornication. We're talking about homosexuality. We're talking about paganism, idol worship. We're talking about all kinds of bad things that were spread. And so the liberals were into these ideas. And Paul's family was a conservative family. 
They believed in the Word of God, and he was patriotic towards his flag. The fifth superiority was a religious superiority. He says, concerning the law of Pharisee. And so it was strict adherence to the Mosaic law. Every Pharisee would have to memorize the first five books of the Bible. That's 613 commands. Word for word, they would memorize it. And they took it literal. Have you ever seen a Hasidic Jew? It would be like a Pharisee. When it says, when it says, tie your prayers to your arm, wear them, it says, wear them on your head. And it says, don't cut the corners of your beard. And if you go to Israel, you're going to see a Hasidic Jew. And you know what they do? They have prayer boxes. They tie to their wrists. And a little box that flips open, they got written now uh, prayers and scriptures inside there. And you'll even see some of them with a prayer box tied to their head. Tied to their head. And they can pop that thing open and pull out scripture and prayers. And they, I don't even understand all of it. They, they have something they wrap around their arm when they're praying. And uh, they don't, they don't, the Hasidic Jews do not cut their sideburns. And those sideburns come down like curly locks. And some of them come all the way down to their shoulder blades. Some of the less conservative Jews won't, they, they cut, they just leave a little strip of their sideburn and they'll take it and flip it up behind their ear. And it'll be, you, you, it's hard to see, but they'll leave it laying behind their ear and it'll kind of grow out into their hair back here. And so they were sticklers for the Mosaic law. They were going to find out a way to keep the law. And the Pharisee was the strictest group there was in adherence to the Mosaic law. It's funny because the Pharisees began as a good group. They wanted to stick with the Bible, but they... Along the way, they forgot the main thing. You know what the main theme of the law is? That it points to Christ. Every ritual performed at the temple pointed to Jesus Christ. Every animal sacrifice pointed to Jesus Christ. And they got so tied up in the religiosity of it, they lost the sight of the fact that the law pointed to the Messiah. Now, there were a few Pharisees that were born again, and we know um, a few of them from Scripture. Nicodemus was one of them. Sixth superiority concerning zeal persecuting the church. And so, Paul was as fired up as anybody could be. You got that? He wanted to kill every Christian there was because he believed that Christianity was trying to destroy Judaism. And he believed that he was preserving Judaism by killing the Christians. And so he was passionate about his life as a Pharisee. And he had worked his tail off. I stop and tell you a story right here because, you know, in life you're going to find out that if you go, I used to play little league baseball. If you play baseball with some some people, you're going to have all kinds of people on the team. You're going to have some people that are so pumped up and excited about baseball, they can't even catch the ball. They're so excited. I mean, they just just bag of nerves. Too excited. Got to calm down. Check it off. Calm down now. Don't get so excited. 
you get some people that are just the right amount of have excited. They they can calm down, but they're excited about the game, and that's the best ones. But then you have some that just can't hardly get out of their own way. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just kind of like molasses on a January morning. It really is painful to watch sometimes. And that's the ones that really aren't, you know, they warm the bench a lot. And uh, Paul is saying here, if you wanted to see passionate about Phariseeism, you look at me. I was leading the way. And uh, he was leading the way to Damascus to persecute more Christians when Jesus Christ got his attention. Struck him down on the road and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And he believed he was doing God's will. Isn't that amazing? Every Muslim in the world believes he's doing God's will when he kills a Jew or a Christian. And so, uh, so did Saul of Tarsus. He had passion for what he was doing. And then also his seventh superiority. His seventh superiority was the law. He had a righteousness concerning the law. You could read through the 613 commands and you could watch Saul's life and he never broke a command. He never broke a rule. See, I know you, you'd be sneaking bacon. You were a Jew, wouldn't you? Yeah. And you'd be uh, sneaking shrimp, wouldn't you? See, I know you all too well. But Saul never cheated. He had strict self-discipline. And when it came to the law, not one infraction. Blameless, he says. So here are the seven superiorities. Human, remember this, human superiorities. Superiorities of the flesh. But in verse 7, we have that famous word, B-U-T, B-U-T. But what things were gained to me, these were his human superiorities, these I have counted loss for Christ. You know what they meant in the spiritual life? Bingo. Zero goose egg. Although Paul had the super apostles whipped when it came to human superiority, it meant nothing in the church age. And that's where we come to little old you. Guess what? Any old stick will do. You know why? Because human superiorities aren't relevant to God. He doesn't care about your human superiorities. They are trash. They're to be thrown out. And just as Balaam's donkey was able to deliver a message, God can use you because he's not into the works of the flesh. He's not into human superiority. He's not into great mankind. Verse 8, yet I... I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. The word for rubbish is actually excrement. To be thrown away, rubbish, that I might gain Christ. And so he uses a very strong word for these human superiorities. I want to look at um, Dr. Vaught leaves us some notes about Paul's road from gains to loss. And I want to share these with you tonight, some of these points. Point one he shares with us, this is the perspective of one who breaks the maturity barrier. So we're saying that Paul came on from babyhood through adolescence, and he's breaking that maturity barrier. 
and what goes along with it, this attitude of leaving behind the human superiorities. This is the attitude of the believer who is occupied with the person of Christ. There are three groups occupied with Christ. Those in super grace, those in ultra super grace, and then also we have pastors, some pastors who lead others into super grace. Point two he gives us. You do not go from gains to loss by giving up something. The goal Paul had reached was not achieved by giving up something or renouncing any human achievement. We are not to give up anything until doctrine forces it out. We are get to get into the Word of God and grow up. And so what he's saying here is he doesn't want you to sell your house, sell your car, sell all of your belongings, and live under a tarp on the side of the road. See, so that's how some people would take this. They'd take it wrong. I need to give up all things. No, the attitude is, is that when the Word of God confronts you about something wrong that you have in your life, that's when you reconcile it, and you may have to decide to get rid of that. Point three, follow to the high ground. Follow to the high ground. It is the attitude of those who follow to the high ground of super grace and replace all your personal gains. Christ is the issue in the Christian life, not things. This passage is a passage on priorities. The passage says, keep your priorities straight. The fourth point Dr. Vaught shares with us tonight don't have a false humility. False humility. Many people think they can gain a real humility by giving up certain things that they have achieved or by giving up certain honors that have come to them. Don't give up the promotions that you have received in life. And so, Dr. Bott's saying here, look, if you have promotions, that's no big deal. That's fine. God promotes his people. Don't give that up like uh, the ascetic would want to beat him, browbeat himself. Oh, I don't deserve that. Go ahead and accept that. But guess what? We understand who we are in Christ is way better than who we are in the world. Point five, continue to grow. Continue to take in doctrine and grow up in grace and come to the place where Christ is first in your life. This is exactly what Paul did. Sixth and final point, God is the great giver. God is the, God is the great giver. God has many blessings for you, and God is glorified by giving you these blessings. It is God who is glorified, not you. This is the way God lets you share in the victory of Christ's cross and resurrection and ascension. All personal gains are now lost for Christ. Dr. Vaught kind of lets us know that somewhere along the way we learn that human promotion is fine and good, but the promotion that comes from God is the best. And the humans may want to elevate you, but guess what? They want to stone you just the next minute. It's kind of like Paul. One minute they wanted to stone him, the next minute they made him a god. And uh, it's the same way in the human realm. Don't get tied up. Receive it if it's correct. But don't place your whole spiritual life on hold trying to be first and foremost in the human realm. I wanted to continue on teaching, and what's going to happen here is that I, I want to start the doctrine of dung, the doctrine of dung, because Paul says here, I count it all as excrement 
waste to be thrown away. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of people use this, and uh, pastors, they use this as an example where they can cuss from the pulpit. I don't know if you knew that or not. They say, well, Paul used the curse word in this verse, and it's not there. And you see the word rubbish in your New King James. It's, it's the word for excrement, and they say, well, Paul used it, so I'm allowed to use it. Well, guess what? That's not salty speech. You know, the Bible says we ought, our, our speech ought to be seasoned with salt and that no corrupt com communication ought to come from our lips. And I truly believe that you can make someone stumble by speaking that way. And the Bible says that we ought not put a stumbling block in front of others. And so I'm simply not going to do it. It goes against everything that I am. Maybe it's because I had a Baptist upbringing. But really and truthfully, I think before man and before God that uh, I think that our speech ought to be considerate of others who may stumble when we use the wrong language. And so we're going to look at the doctrine of dung the doctrine of dung. Point one is the definition. Excrement or dung is used in scripture to teach certain truths of doctrine, usually in a negative way. I would expect so. The reason is that excrement is objectionable to our finest senses, but it makes an excellent illustration. We do not have one word in the Bible for dung. We actually have six. Five are in the Hebrew and one is in the Greek. Ash pit, it means dung hill or pile of dung. Galel, it means human excrement. Gulal, almost the same word as above. Domen, used in Jeremiah 8.2. Peresh, used in Malachi 2.3. And Skubalon, that's the one in the Greek. So you have six different words for dung or excrement. Point two under the doctrine of dung. Dung is used to describe the celebrity standards of Judaism. It is so used in our passage here in Philippians 3.8, that I may gain Christ. It means to go on and end up in grace. Paul is not going to let any great human celebrity ship keep him from Christ. And so even though, see, Judaism had its celebrities. It had its celebrities, just like Christianity has its celebrities. And Paul is saying, I count it as dung, going in the trash heap. Point three under the doctrine of dung. Dung is used to describe the fifth cycle of discipline to a nation. Jeremiah 16, 4. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented. Neither shall they be buried, but they shall be dung on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall fall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of earth. So Jeremiah 16, 4 relates dung to the fifth cycle of discipline. These are the reversionists who got killed in the fifth cycle of discipline when Judea was overrun. Also, Jeremiah 25, 33. Jeremiah 25, 33. Isn't it amazing how Jeremiah used such vivid language to warn his fellow Israelis about what was going to happen? And yet no one listened. Jeremiah 25, 33, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Also, Jeremiah 8, 2, And Zephaniah 1.17. Point 
four under the doctrine of dung. <clears throat> point four under the doctrine of dung. Dung is used to portray the judgment of the wicked. Job twenty four through seven. Dung is used to portray the judgment of the wicked. Job twenty four through seven. Knowest thou not this of old? since man was placed upon the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite, hypocrite but for a moment, though his excellently, excellently mount up to the heavens, and his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung, they which have seen him will say, where is he? And so we see that the wicked will be judged, and they will perish. Point five. Four, five. Point five, dung was used to intimidate and threaten the Jews. Dung was used to intimidate and threaten the Jews to a surrender to the Syrians. Second Kings 18.27 Also, Isaiah thirty six twelve. Isaiah thirty six twelve. So this is the way the Assyrians tried to scare the Jews. A messenger sent, he says, my master has sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall at who will eat and drink their own waste with you. He's pointing to the fact that they were about to lay siege to the Jews and that they were going to eat their own excrement. Point six. The interpretation, the, excuse me, the interruption of the Jewish age plus the administration of the fifth cycle of discipline is described as dumb. So the end of the Jewish age and the beginning of the administration of the fifth cycle of discipline is described as dung. Malachi 2.3. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts. And one shall take you away with it. Only two more points. Point seven. Dung is used to describe the fall of mighty ones. Dung is used to describe the fall of mighty ones. Lamentation 4-5. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dung hills. It's talking about the princes of Judea. Now out in the scrap heap. Lamentation 4 5. Point 8. Dung is used to describe the uselessness of the reversionistic believer. Luke 14, 34 and 35. Dung is used to describe the uselessness of the reversionistic believer. I've been around a few reversionists. They are useless. That, well, they're useful for one thing, to test you. 
Yeah, they'll test you all right. Four and eight. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, that's doctrine. Wherewith shall it be seasoned? How's it going to take in more doctrine? It is neither fit for the land, it's going to get cast out, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath hear, ears to hear, let him hear. And so Jesus used the analogy of reversionistic believers. Uh, Luke 14, Luke 14, 34 and 35. He relates the idea of the reversionist being cast out of the land on the fifth cycle of this one. He doesn't even get to go to the scrap pile outside the gate. He's not even fit to throw on the scrap pile. He has to go all the way out of the land. So that's point eight. The doctrine of dumb. So let's go back to our verse and now we'll have a better idea about how Paul speaks about his human superiorities in verse eight. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Look, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord is Bible doctrine. It's the thinking of Christ. He's counting all everything else for loss for the thinking of Christ. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, all my human superiorities, gone, and count them as dung, that I may gain Christ. You see, if Paul had tried to take any of his human superiorities into the Christian way of life, it would have hindered him. It would have hindered him. So I'm going to give you a diagram to end with. And if you don't get anything, maybe you'll get this. If we look at arrogance, let's just put a giant A right here. If we look at human arrogance, what you're going to find out, it, got, it travels in two directions. Normally, we're going to look at one facet of arrogance because arrogance is a multifaceted gem. Not really a gem, it's a lump of coal, but if you're going to look at human arrogance, this facet of human arrogance that we're going to look at tonight, here's two directions it'll travel. One direction says, I am way better. I like to we just say, I'm way better than everyone else. In other words, it develops into a self-righteous arrogance. You could put SR. When I compare myself to everyone else and everyone else's ability, I'm really good. I'm Superman. In my flesh, I am great. I'm better than they are. I'm good. I'm the best. And if the race car drivers have the biggest, fattest heads on the, plate, on the planet, I get to deal with them all the time. And some of them have gone so far that they're in a state of psychosis. They don't even know who they are, but they think they're good. You get this? If you watch them, you'll see it. There are a lot of athletes that get this way, too. Self-righteous arrogance. I am so good out here. I'm better than everyone else. I don't know how I got this good, but I'm just really good. And then you have over here the person who says, I am bad. I am worthless. I am nothing. I am afflicted. I'm downtrodden. I'm not worth anything. I I just, I ought not, not even be living. I think I'll just kill myself. This is where they go. And if you had to put a label on which one is worse, which one do you think is worse? It's this one over here. This one over here, you can bring him back to reality. If he's a race car driver, all he's got to do is crash into a concrete wall, and he'll say, well, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. But this one over here, this type of arrogance, 
is very hard to deal with because this person their entire life has been patted on the back and said everything's going to be okay you just need to look up and that's how they got encouragement by flexing their arrogance skills right out here i'm not any good i don't even know why i was born i wish i could just die and that is a atrocious kind of arrogance and you say well where do i need to be at see neither one of these will work here's what you have to do let me put you right here who you are in Christ who you are in Christ it doesn't matter how good you think you are see that's a human superiority and it doesn't matter how bad you think you are get out of your self-pity get out of that mud hole and find out who you are in Christ because that's who God says you are that's who God says you are and anything else is human arrogance human arrogance so you better find out who you are in Christ see in Christ you're a new spiritual species in Christ you're royalty in Christ you share all Christ has and is in Christ you belong to God's family and we could go on but the idea how are we going to get rid of human arrogance how do we get rid of this we exchange that human arrogance for the truth about who we are in Christ then guess what happens when you find out who you are in Christ you become sane become sane over here you're living in a world of insanity because you're either you think you're better than you really are you think you're worse than you really are and what you are is crazy you're crazy because you don't know who God says you are and so that's the point of coming to Bible class and uh, I'm gonna stop right there